People are easily offended or negative. They believe the worst when they should believe the best. They're an easy mark for Satan because he baits the trap and they take the bait every time. They're miserable because being offended makes you a whole lot more miserable than it makes the other person. They're hindering God's plan for their lives because they cannot go forward with bad attitude. The Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. That's our job. We have to guard our heart and make sure that we don't let wrong things get in. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs it down and makes it heavy. It's unwise. Because any time God tells us in his word not to do something, we do it anyway, it's unwise. So if the Bible says, don't be easily offended, don't be touchy, and we just go ahead and get offended, we're like mere unchanged men. Let's think for a minute about King David. You know, when Samuel, the prophet, came to anoint a new king out of Jesse's household, who was David's father, all the sons were brought before him and the prophet could not find one that he felt was the one that was to be anointed as king. Well, don't you have any other sons? Well, well yeah, I mean, there is David, but, you know. <laughs> they didn't even think enough of David to bring him in for the lineup. I wonder how that would make you feel. However, David had been out in the fields worshiping God, writing psalms, writing songs, worshiping God, and so he didn't care all that much what everybody else thought. He cared more about what God thought. Well, guess what? Even though nobody else thought to include David, God thought to include David. And, and David was God's choice. You may not be people's choice, but you can be God's choice. Apparently, they thought David was too young, or he wasn't smart enough, or he wasn't this, or he wasn't that. But God chose David. And let me tell you something. We need to learn how to live before an audience of one, and it's this one. We need to stop living for all the people and to impress all the people and trying to make sure all the people are clapping for us all the time. And we need to get our eyes on God and keep our eyes on God and do what we do unto the Lord and stop worrying so much about how people treat us and be more concerned about how we're treating other people. When I stand before God, I'm not gonna have to give an account of how other people treated me. They will answer for that. Come on, did anybody hear me today? Romans 14, 12, every man will stand before God and give an account of himself. If somebody has mistreated you, when they stand before God, they will give an account of that. But you will not be asked to give an account of why they mistreated you. You will be asked to give an account of why you let it offend you. And why you wasted five years being mad. And why you interrupted the plan of God in your life for six months while you were nursing your feelings. Ooh, I'm preaching good today. I think I'll just go on. <laughs> you know, some of you just need to get a little holy anger and you need to stomp your little holy foot and you need to make an announcement to the devil and you need to say, that's it. I have wasted my last day being offended by somebody who probably doesn't even know what they're doing. Everybody say, it's not about me. Boy, we need to remember that, don't we? <laughs> well, you hurt my feelings and that didn't make me feel good and now I'm mad and I'm not gonna talk to you. And I mean, you know. <laughs> okay, champions refuse to be offended. Go to 2 Timothy 4. Paul said at my first trial, 2 Timothy 4, 16, this is amazing, at my first trial, no one acted in my defense <laughs> as my advocate or took my part, or even stood with me, but all forsook me. <laughs> May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me, and he strengthened me. Wow. Nobody stood with me, Paul said. None of the people I'd ministered to, none of the people whose lives have been changed by my ministry, 
Nobody stood by me. He was going through the same thing that Jesus went through in the Garden of Gethsemane. All this input I've had into your life, and now you cannot stand with me for one hour. You know what, we all go through that kind of stuff. It's part of what determines whether we can go on with God or whether we've got to stay in kindergarten the rest of our life. Hello? Champions are not easily offended because champions are not all caught up in what about me, what about me, what about me, what about me? Amen? Amen. Champions want to be used by God and they know they cannot get offended. When David was sent out to check on the, the battle and to take his brothers some cheese and something to drink, he began to ask questions. Well, why is nobody coming against this Philistine, Goliath. Why is everybody just standing around and sitting around and letting him make a fool out of the Israelites? What shall be done for the person who slays him? Now his older brother Eliab, who was apparently jealous because he already knew that David was anointed to be king, said, with whom have you left those few sheep that you tend to? You know, as soon as you want to do something great for God, somebody will come along and try to make you feel little. You? You? Well, you don't have the personality for that. How do you think you're gonna do that? You know what the Bible says? It's in 1 Samuel 17. It says that David turned away from Eliab. You know, basically what he was saying, I don't have any time for that nonsense. You know what? God's got a call on your life. God has got a plan for your life. And Satan keeps baiting the trap. He keeps trying to pull you into his trap and he does it through hurt feelings and people offending you and wounding you. And then it stops the plan of God for your life because now you gotta deal with all these feelings. You don't have time to waste your time like that anymore. God's got something good for you and you need to just get over what everybody else is doing to you and say, you know what, God? I can't care about what they're doing to me. I just wanna make sure I'm not acting like they are and, and being deceived. All right, now, let's just look at a few scriptures today about what the Bible has to say about not giving offense. Actually, Paul said, we strive not to give offense. This is called walk the walk and talk the talk. Police aren't perfect, but this particular policeman came close to winning the Ingenuity Award. A driver did the right thing, stopping at the school crosswalk, even though he could have beaten the red light by accelerating through the intersection. The tailgating woman behind him went ballistic pounding on her horn, screaming in frustration as she missed the chance to drive through the intersection with him. Still in mid-rant, she heard a tap on her window and looked up into the face of a very serious police officer. The officer ordered her to exit the car with her hands up. He took her to the police station where she was searched, fingerprinted, photographed, and placed in a cell. After a couple of hours, a policeman approached the cell, opened the door, she was escorted back to the booking desk where the arresting officer was waiting with her personal effects. He said, ma'am, I'm awfully sorry for this mistake. You see, as I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing your horn and cussing a blue streak, I noticed the what would Jesus do license plate holder, the follow me to Sunday school bumper sticker, the chrome plated Christian fish emblem on the trunk, and the my boss is a Jewish carpenter decal on your back window. Naturally, I assumed the car had been stolen. <laughs> One of the reasons why in our announcements we tell people at our conferences, in your hotels, and when you're out and about in the city and you're going to restaurants to eat, to not be rude is because you would be amazed how people watch Christians and how they watch people that are supposedly at Christian events. And we had one Christian ministry in our city who just left such a bad impression that it was absolutely pathetic. 
They didn't pay their bills. They complained about everything. They tore up the rooms. They were rude in the restaurants. And sometimes when we go to cities and other Christian ministries have been there that have behaved that way, actually, to tell you the truth, they dread having you. Well, I'm happy to say that as far as I know, we have a good reputation, and it's because we tell our people, don't be rude. Don't be rude. Do not be rude. Go the extra mile to adapt and adjust and to be kind. Give good tips. Say, I'm sorry. Say please and thank you. Don't be demanding. Don't be ridiculous. Because we have to have more than a bumper sticker if we're going to impress the world. We need to be much more careful about not offending somebody else than we are concerned about who is offending us. 2 Corinthians 6, 3. We put no obstruction in anybody's way. We give no offense in anything so that no fault may be found and our ministry blamed and discredited. Wow, that's good. Isn't that good? Paul said, listen, we strive in our ministry to make sure we're not offending people. You know, I wish sometimes that I had more time to explain things to people who come to these conferences with certain expectations that we cannot meet. Because sometimes just a word of explanation will keep somebody from being offended. I can't always do that because of the time it would take in these meetings. But any time that you can explain yourself, you're so much better to just take a moment to do that because there's always going to be insecure people all around that are going to believe the worst if you don't give that word of explanation. 1 Corinthians 10, 32, 33. Do not let yourselves be a hindrance by giving an offense to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, and do not lead others into sin by your mode of life. Just as I myself strive to please, to accommodate myself to the opinions, desires, and interests of others, adapting myself to all men in everything I do, not aiming or considering my own profit and advantage, but that of the many in order that they may be saved. Man, do we understand what Paul was saying? Paul was saying, you know what, really no matter what I want or what I would prefer, when I get in a situation where I feel like there's any possibility at all that I can minister to somebody, I am going to adapt and adjust to what I feel like they need so the door stays open for me to minister to them. You know what Proverbs says? A brother offended is hard to win. You need to be especially careful. I mean, we need to be careful everywhere just because that should be our character. But boy, you want to be careful around the unbelievers that you work with. I mean, don't give them a reason to judge you. Don't give them a reason to think you're a hypocrite. Make sure that you walk the walk and don't just talk the talk. Do something more around these unbelievers than just carry around a big Bible and quote scriptures to them all the time. Why don't you try doing some stuff for them? Walking in love, being kind. You know, all that Christian stuff we're supposed to be doing. Okay, 1 Corinthians 9. These are all just right in a close area, but I want us to see these. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. Through 22, and these are, these are good right here. For although I'm free in every way from anyone's control, I've made myself a bondservant to everyone so that I might gain the more for Christ. To the Jews I become as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To men under the law I become as one under the law though not myself being under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those without outside the law, I become as one outside of the law. Not that I am without the law and lawless toward him, but that I am especially keeping within my commitment to the law of Christ, that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak, I become weak. I love that. You know what? Little wisdom. 
if you're around somebody that is just as sick as a dog, and they're telling you how they have had this awful virus for three weeks, and they feel so bad, and no matter what they've done, they just can't get over it. That is not the time to give them your healing testimony. <gasps> that same thing tried to come on me, and I just rebuked it. Now, I'm not talking about if they know nothing about healing that you can't share with them that God would want to heal them. What I'm talking about is when you're around somebody who already knows all that stuff, and for whatever reason, they have not gotten a supernatural miracle from God, they're sick. What they need is compassion. What they need is understanding. Oh, man, that must be bad. Now, you know what? That same thing tried to come on me, and I just prayed and rebuked the devil, and I just got well instantly. Oh, well, good for you. That didn't make them feel any better. We have to learn to be more sensitive to where other people are at and what they're going through and what they might need. My aunt, who's of a Baptist background, I remember when my, when my uncle died, it was very painful for her. They'd been married since she was like 15 and they'd never had any kids. And they were very, very close. And so he died and one of my charismatic employees went to the funeral home and looked at my aunt and said, well, praise the Lord. Well, my aunt was so hurt and so offended. This woman didn't mean any harm, but she wasn't being sensitive. Are we awake today? <laughs> she wasn't being sensitive to where my aunt was at or her background. What did Paul say? To the Jew, I'm a Jew. To the Greek, I'm a Greek. You might get around a few people that it wouldn't be the best thing to be quoting them a scripture every five minutes. Sometimes you might need to just sit down and cry with somebody for a while. You might have a greater open door if you would hurt with them and shed a few tears rather than preaching to them all the time. Some of us word people, we got a word for everybody. <laughs> well, I have a word for you today. Be more sensitive to what's going on around you and who's hurting and what people are going through. And let's be more like Paul. To the weak, I became weak. Oh man, I understand what you're going through. Yeah, boy, I've been through the same stuff in my life. Yeah, I understand. Not, oh, well, you know, praise God. You've been struggling with smoking for 12 years. I just quit. Just like that, just quit. <laughs> Yep, got delivered the day I got saved from drugs, alcohol, medicine, blah, blah, never, never taken an aspirin in my life. Blah, 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 blah. Well, good for you. <laughs> you know, don't be like Sister Super Christian who has a gift in intercession. She gets up and prays four hours every day and then goes to lunch with, you know, little Mary New Christian. And Mary New Christian is all excited about her new relationship with God and Oh, man, I prayed 15 minutes this morning. Oh, I had a great time with God. Oh, it's just awesome. And Sister Super Christian says, You only prayed 15 minutes? <sighs> oh. I start praying every morning at 4, and I don't stop till 9. <laughs> now, here's Mary New Believer. Because Sister Super Christian didn't have any sensitivity about what to tell and when to tell it and what kind of an attitude to have when she told it. Amen? We took a couple of dinner one night. This has been many, many years ago. And they were a couple that didn't have very much, and Dave and I just wanted to bless them by taking them to a nice restaurant. And you know, like women do, her and I went to the bathroom together. I know you guys don't understand that. I don't know that I do either, but, you know. <laughs> Every time I'm at a restaurant, I always say to the women, do you want to go to the bathroom? Wouldn't it look stupid if Dave got up and said to the men, do you want to go to the bathroom? 
But it's just a woman thing, you know. So anyway, her and I went to the bathroom. She's in one stall, I'm in the other stall. Okay. That week, I had torn up so many pair of pantyhose. And as I was getting myself adjusted and dressed, I put a runner in yet another pair of pantyhose. And I said, oh, man, this is like the third or fourth pair of pantyhose I've ruined in a week. So she gives me her testimony. She said, you know what? I pray over my pantyhose. <laughs> and she says, I have had the same pair for six months. Well, now, you know, I've got my little ministry starting, and I'm teaching my home Bible studies, and I'm Miss Faith and Power, Woman of the Hour, and I'm thinking, never occurred to me to pray over my pantyhose. <laughs> now I'm thinking, wow, six months, really? And I've torn up four pair this week? But I left condemned. Now, I see her three days later. She said, you know, the weirdest thing happened. She said, the day after I told you my testimony about my pantyhose, I tore them things up. <laughs> now, I go to God and I say, God, why is it that that happens so often? That we've got this great victory and then as soon as we tell our testimony, we lose the victory. You know what he said to me? Because most of the time when you give your testimony, all you're doing is bragging. You're not really trying to help somebody else with your testimony. You're just trying to look a little bit better than them. Be sensitive. Well, you know, I believe that we have to just make a decision that we are not going to be easily offended. As a matter of fact, I think that's a real integral part of spiritual maturity. You know, you can get your feelings hurt, and you can take offense, or you can refuse to take offense. I believe that we need to make sure that we're more concerned about what God thinks of us than what other people are doing to us. Well, I believe that Jesus is our healer, and I know that we have not because we ask not. And I'm also sure that there are many people right now watching that you have pain in your body, or you've gotten a bad report from the doctor, or you know something that's physically wrong with you, and you know, maybe everything that you're doing is just not helping or not working. And I want to pray for you right now. The Bible says that we can pray the prayer of faith and the sick will be healed. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And I'm praying right now over every person watching right now that they will be healed if they're sick, that they'll have divine health. I don't believe we have to just go from sickness to sickness and pain to pain, but I think that we can have divine health. So I remind you of your word that you not only bore our sins and iniquities, but you bore our sicknesses and our diseases. You took our pain. You took our punishment. And so I say to everyone today, be healed in Jesus' name. We take authority in Jesus' name over pain in your bodies, over sickness and disease. And I just say you are going to be healthy and whole in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, one of the things I always do is encourage people to get in agreement with my prayer by making some good confessions. Because I need you to agree with me, and we both want to agree with the Word of God. So no matter how you feel, why don't you say several times every day, I believe the healing power of God is working in me right now, and every day I get better and better in every way. God bless you.